exactly the contrary on, it, on my data. Uh, in this case, however, you need to uh, bear in mind that my data is limited um, and it's different from the data that I used before. And also the operationalization of uh, the meaning of uh, identity might be questionable. So, uh, what, I uh, what I found is that it is the achieved meaning of identity, the one that um, has increased in Germany, but also in Southern European countries. Uh, at the same time, mixed identities, which is the most usual type of identity, has decreased. So, you can see that in figure um, 4 and 5 in the handout. So, in figure 4, uh, below the zero line, it means that ascribed meanings of identity, remember ascribed meanings were those given to you upon birth, are overweight the achieved meanings. And over the zero line means that achieved meanings, those that you can uh, acquire, uh, overweight ascribed meanings. So you see how over time they have changed and also in figure 5, you see that the amount of people, the percentage of citizens who hold uh, mixed identities has changed. Uh, mixed uh, identities uh, means that both cultural and civic, or ascribed and achieved items, are given similar importance for the feeling of attachment to the country. So, you've seen that having uh, had been born in the country is important, but you also think that paying your taxes is important. So that's a mixed type, I call that a mixed type of identity. It's not purely uh, cultural or um, ascribed, it's not purely um, civic or achieved. Uh, so you see that that has decreased, uh, the mixed identities have decreased, but the difference is not uh, going to the increase of uh, ascribed identities. It's going to the increase of uh, um, achieved identities. And that was contrary to my hypothesis. Uh, part of that change might be due to the fact that I'm using different databases. So 2002 is a different one from 2007 and 9. 2002 is a Eurobarometer, and 2007 and 9 are Intune database. And the number of items common between these two are limited, so the way I measure ascribe and achieve dimensions is also limited. So that's something uh, you should take into account. And also, the dates are not the best dates that I can choose, but I mean, that was what was uh, available. So this is a puzzle. Um, uh, although that some difference might be due to the data, it makes sense with some other information that I have, for example, for Germany, and that's something we can go uh, a little bit deeper into after the presentation, if that uh, something that interests you. So that's at the aggregate level, the change in meaning of identity, and what happened at the individual level. So uh, you can now look at table 5 uh, in your handout. Uh, this again is a different data um, because the other data that was using for the aggregate level didn't have um, economic um, Variables. So I need to look for another study that have uh, economic variables at the same time that the question on meaning of identity, which is this uh, another EU barometer. Uh, so what you can see here is that those people having troubles to pay uh, their monthly bills uh, are more likely to hold um, uh, ascribed meanings of identity. So here you have the reference for those who always have problems to pay their monthly bills. As compared to those, those are the people who only have problems from time to time or never have problems, they have a higher probability to have a achieved understanding of identity and lower probability <coughs> of having ascribed um, types of identity. And only uh, 
Though only partially, the level of society is also showing that. So those in the lower levels of society have a higher probability of seeing that having parents from the country is important for uh, uh, the meaning of identity. And of course, that I think uh, pertain or belong to the dimension of um, uh, ascribed identities. So this finding suggests that citizens are that worse off citizens are welfare uh, chauvinists because not only um, those with economic problems are uh, more, I mean, tend to have a more ascribed means of identity, remember also that they tend to have stronger attachment to their country. So, to conclude, uh, at the individual level, uh, our hypotheses are backed by our analysis, and so we find that economic hardship correlates with um, um, having uh, stronger identities, and furthermore with uh, the ascribed meanings of those um, identities. Something that we can probably label as uh, welfare, chauvinist, national attitudes. Uh, Although these findings do not prove um, a causal correlation between the economic crisis and the change on uh, identities, uh, the system of this correlation, which is um, possibly with our expectations, uh, means that we cannot rule out that causal relationship. However, uh, at the country level, uh, our findings are somehow contradictory and they are not easy to interpret in relation to these individual findings. Uh, so, and speculating here. So, I might propose that since the number of welfare chauvinists have uh, not increased at the aggregate level, we can hypothesize that the main effect of the um, economic crisis has been in the political mobilization of those citizens and that has made them more visible and give us the impression of an increasing number of um, nativist attitudes, especially in those countries where the uh, populist radical right is doing better. Nonetheless, the effect of such political mobilization seems to be also uh, that an increasing number of people is deserting mixed types of identities, that was usual before, and moving to just uh, um, achieve uh, identities. And I think that might be a reaction to differentiate themselves from nationalists, uh, um, nativists, radical, or whatever we want to call uh, welfare uh, chauvinists. And that's it. I just will um, put here the um, images that I use because I think it's important to give them recognition. Okay. I think it was shorter than the 40 minutes, maybe. So that's the presentation. Questions for Antonia? Or criticism, or whatever. Well, thank you, Antonia. I'm going to start with love, because the sun's shining, so I'm thinking about love. And I thought it was quite interesting you were defining national identity, national feelings, in terms of love. But I like to think that you choose your love. Yeah. Um, so, a couple of things. One. You know, Michael Billig, when he talks about nationalism and national identity, he talks about that connection is banal. I thought that love isn't banal. I'm just wondering the, the, the way that you're describing that, I'm wondering how that comes out, whether that comes out in the data or if you're using that kind of rhetorically. And the second thing is about choice. Um, so it strikes me that you're connecting the state and economy. So the way the country is run, the way the economy uh, is done, the way political choices are made with the nation. And I wonder if there is such a, a connect, or whether, and this maybe goes beyond your data, because it's more recent, maybe some of the 
contemporary trends in European and global nationalisms is about loving your country but hating or mistrusting the establishment, whatever that is. I'm thinking Brexit here, you know, and the sort of you know, embracing of national identity in rejection of um, the established political class. So I'm just wondering how that might fit, might not problematize some of your hypotheses. Okay, so about if the um, that feeling may be banal or not, I think that banality really refers to how elites handle um, the way they try to construe or reproduce uh, national identity more than how people experience that. So um, a banalization is when. I mean, for me, it's when you don't need to uh, make explicit mobilization of uh, the people on their national identity. So it's something that has happened in uh, well-established states where the nation and the state overlap fairly smoothly, uh, because otherwise it's not going to be banal. Uh, leads were going to mobilize that 